Hello there, Romans here and today I decided to do something different for a change. I decided to rank all the albums from Rush going from worst to best. I personally am a bigger fan of going through the discography either when listening to the group or when talking about it chronologically to see all the evolution, all the changes, but I do find the concept of going from worst to best very appealing. I myself have seen quite a few videos like that on YouTube. I have read quite many lists like that on the internet so I decided to do that with Rush and give you my own personal opinion don't forget it's just my opinion I ain't gonna talk about individual records in too much detail as I have made a three-part video of reviewing all the Rush records so you can check that out on my YouTube channel if you want I myself am a huge fan of Rush as you can see I have all of their records except the last one which I'm planning to purchase I have these sectors it's actually pretty cool also I review all the records from a viewpoint of a songwriter as I am a singer songwriter bass player and it's been something like two months ago that I've released my first debut album called Pursuits in Life and I think if you are clicked on this video you're gonna like this record because it's a pretty heavy prog rock music but without any guitars, instead you have drums, bass, saxophone and keyboards making this record pretty much one of a kind and a very unique experience, listening experience. So you can check out the first single on my YouTube channel, it's called We're Building Our Own Monument and the record is available everywhere. It's available on Spotify, Deezer, Tidal, iTunes, Amazon, but also physical copies if you want. It's made in a digi digi pack with a very beautiful 20 pages booklet that I think you're gonna like. So enough of spamming, let's start with Rush and let's start with the countdown. Before I even start I'm gonna review just the studio albums from Rush so no live concerts, no feedback which is a covers album. So let's start with number 19 Vapor Trails from 2002. Now I can see why this record was so anticipated and so hyped at that time not that I remember that I was a kid, but based on what I've read, Rush broke up in the second half of the 90s due to the many tragedies that Neil Part, the drummer, had in his life. So it was kind of logical that he called it quits. And the band got together and released a new album after eight years. And it really feels like it. Now, I love Rush. I will say that probably many times throughout this countdown, but this record is just horrible, really. The, the biggest problem is that it's just too long. Now, the thing I really loved about Rush in the past was that with the exception of a few records like Roll the Bones and Counterparts, they made records that were around 40 minutes long that had few tracks, but it felt like every track was important, every track had a personality of its own, had its own place on a record, and there wasn't any waste of space. But this record is just way too long, it's like 67 minutes, there's no variety, literally all the songs sound the same, the production is horrible even though that the record was remastered 11 years later which improved the production quality a little bit but not too much and it's just a record that's so tiring to, listening, to listen to but the problem is that you will not get rewarded with the repeated listenings. Certain songs like One Little Big Tree Stars Look Down, Secret Touch, they have some moments but for example the song How It Is, it just had such a stupid and cheesy chorus so this is definitely a record I can live without and that I'm probably not going to get back to ever, hopefully. At number 18 we have Snakes and Arrows, the follow-up record to Vapor Trails from 2007 and this record pretty much suffers from the same problems the previous one did. It's too long there's no variety, it sounds uninspired and it's very tiring to listen to. I really like the instrumentals like Hope or Malignant Narcissism which are really great. Uh, the song Larger Bobble sounds like R.E.M. song but the rest really there aren't many recognizable or memorable songs. Again a record I can live without. Number 17 we're going to the Rush's self-titled debut album from 1974. Now this record is interesting only if you are a really big fan of Rush and you want to see kind of that place where they came from. On this record they pretty much sound just like every other classic hard rock 70s group. I really like the attitude 
the sound, the production and the overall appeal of the record because you can really feel the energy and you can really feel that these guys were following their dreams. The first two tracks, Finding My Way and Need Some Love, are both pretty cool but there isn't really anything to make these records stand apart. Uh, even the very big hit at that time called Working Man is a song that just never really worked for me. So generally I think this is a pretty forgettable record and it's also the only record that didn't have Neil part on drums and also on words. Number 16, Cares of Steel, 1975, the Rush's third album. It seems like after every two records Rush came up with a transitional record where they tried to redefine themselves and they did it pretty much after every two records and most of the times it worked. This was the first time when they did it and it didn't work. Now, Best Still Day, it's a great track. For example, the second track, I think I'm going bold, has essentially the same riff as the song In The Mood from the Rush debut album. I mean, the third record, it's relatively too soon to kind of reuse your own stuff. And Obviously this was a record where Rush tried to be a more experimental and progressive group but the two long tracks don't really work. I mean The Necromancer is a song that is really just a failed attempt and The Fountain of Lammoth has certain moments like for example Part 3 sounds really cool. I like those acoustic, mysterious, sort of a creepy parts but it really feels like four random songs put together without too much logic and it's quite funny that on their previous record Fly By Night they had a song by Tor and the Snow Dog and this song was also around eight or nine minutes but it worked much better than these two tracks so this is really another record that I'm probably not going to get back to very often if at all I like the production, I like the sound plus this was the co a complete commercial failure from Rush where the label threatened them, them one bad record and you're done for. Fortunately, we know the story, but this is not a very good album. Number 15. Well, before I even start, I'm a huge fan of what Rush did in the 80s. I think that most of the 80s records are fantastic. And I also said many times that you can pretty much listen to Rush from 2112 up until Counterparts and all those records within this period are fantastic. With Presto being the exception. The Presto from 1989 was the first record that sort of a failed to be a transitional record. Now, Carries of Steel was their attempt to do progressive music, A Farewell to Kings was a full-blown progressive group, Permanent Waves was Rush moving more into an accessible commercial territory, Signals was where they started to use synthesizers and keyboards, Power Windows was Rush becoming more puppy, and Presto was Presto. Nothing really happened. Some people may argue that band put more focus and more emphasis on guitars and keyboards and synthesizers became more of a arrangement stuff, but the record is pretty much the same in terms of songwriting as the previous two records. Now I think Power Windows and Hold Your Fire were fantastic records, but Presto was pretty much the same kind of record and it felt like leftovers from these two records and even though that there are two absolutely fantastic songs Red Tide and Available Light and there are few great moments now and then generally this is a record I'm most likely to skip when I get back to Rush. We're getting to number 14 and I guess at this point most of you are wondering where's the test for Echo? I mean that's the worst album from Rush isn't it? Well guess what? It isn't. Test for Echo from 1996 was for a pretty long time the last Rush album because of the reasons I've explained when I was talking about Vapor Trails is usually the last on many of the lists ranking the Rush records and I personally can't see why. There are a few weaker moments like for example Dog Years I mean come on who told them that yeah guys Dog Years is a great song put it on a record that's, an, that's such an abomination of a song but apart from that you've got a pretty solid album that has a pretty solid songwriting this is slightly about average, it's not a fantastic or great album, but I think it's still enjoyable and I don't have problems getting back to this album, like certain songs like uh, Half the World or Virtuosity, uh, Virtuality, sorry, why not? I think a pretty cool album. At number 13 we have The Rush's last studio album from 2012 called Clockwork Angels. This record still, in my opinion, suffers a little bit from what the previous two horrible records suffered from and is the overall length of the album, 
lack of variety and sort of a sameness of the songs but those are really just the minor complaints. Now this album is such a huge improvement in terms of songwriting and production and this is an overall great album. This is probably the heaviest and the grooviest Rush have ever been. The lyricism, it's got a great concept and generally I think that the songs are really very cool. Like for example you have Caravan, uh, Carnies and one of the huge gems for me, The Garden, which is just such a unique song within the Rush discography. Now if this is the record that is the last from the Rush, well heads down. At number 12 we have a record that in my opinion tends to be a little polarizing because I have seen lists where the record was really high up there and then there were lists where it was relatively low and generally it seems like a very overlooked and underappreciated album and we're talking about the second album from Rush from 1975 Fly By Night. Now I think Fly By Night was the first struck of genius. This album continues that sort of a hard rock 70s classic rock formula of the debut album but it is an improvement in every way. I'm not sure if it was because Neil Part finally entered the group and joined the group as the lyricist and the drummer but you know you have so many great, great songs like the Fly By Night, Anthem, then the long track that would sort of a predict what kind of a stories and long tracks they would do for the most of 70s by Tor and the Snow Dog. Really a song that really works, it's a great song. And then one of the most unique songs in the Rush discography, Rivendale, a Lord of the Rings influenced track where you hear acoustic guitar with nil and strings. I think this is a very good album. Okay, all the remaining 11 records are pretty much fantastic records, so it was very difficult for me to rank them. You can pick up any of those records, all of them are fantastic and it kind of breaks my heart to put them in the order but let's do it. Number 11, 1987, Hold Your Fire. This was a record that came out after Power Windows and at that point people knew kind of what record to expect. It's a very poppy record, very accessible, very radio friendly but still very enjoyable. I think that this is amazing about Rush, that they were able to do commercially sounding music but without sacrificing being Rush. This album is exciting, you can really feel all the attitude and all the passion behind the songs. And it also contains one of my all-time favorite songs from Rush, Mission. It has just beautiful bass line, it's a beautifully made track and I like that they maintain that certain technicality and musicality throughout the songs even though that this record is easier to listen to. Definitely a very underappreciated record not really sure why. At number 10 we have a record that Alex Lifeson stated to be his favorite from Rush, so it's 1984 Grace Under Pressure. Now this record continued what Rush started on the previous record, the heavy use of synthesizers and keyboards and this record has slightly more guitars than the predecessor but still it's it's very 80s. Some people may even criticize its outdated production but I'm a huge 80s nerd, so I just love it. The only complaint from a songwriting point of view I have is the song Body Electric, which I, where I don't really like the chorus. 100, 100, 1, SOS. I mean, it doesn't work for me. But some songs like uh, Between the Wheels or Red Sector A, fantastic songs. And this, I think this is a very strong album that has certain police influences. At number 9 we have another transitional record, Permanent Waves. Now the predecessor to this record was a very tiring experience for Rush, that's why they decided to sort of leave all the progressive experimental Rush behind and do something new, do something more fun, more commercial, but I think that they succeeded but not completely abandoning what they became famous for. And this is a record where you still hear quite a lot of progressiveness, like for example in the song Natural Science, Different Strings, is just a beautiful ballad. And you can hear that Rush tried new things, they made it sound very fresh, and this is why Rush are so famous, because the predecessor was a fantastic record, but they did something new that was almost equally as good. And it's just amazing to see how many times they redefined themselves. Permanent Waves is honestly a record that took a little time to grow on me because at first I felt it was a very cold album but with the repeated listenings and with me returning to that record 
year by year I got more fond of it. It's, it's a really great album. Number 8, 1991, Roll the Bones. Now it breaks my heart how many people smash this record and how many people hate this record. I mean, Roll the Bones was a fantastic album. It came after a relatively disappointing presto, but you can hear that Rush were incorporating some of that alternative rock and even pop rock into their music, but they did so in a very traditional Rush fashion. Now the songwriting is great, there are such a strong melodies and I like that the record isn't necessarily technical or complex, but it's very enjoyable to listen to. Maybe the only track that I would improve a little bit is the song Face Up, which I would either make heavier or more melodic. But apart from that, I think that this is a very good sounding album. Number 7, 1993, Counterparts. Now this is a record that reflects the ever-changing waters of music business quite a lot. Mid-90s were arguably the most depressive and darkest period in music business. And you can hear the influences of alternative rock, alternative metal, and Rush found their spot and they were able to write music even in these difficult times. And I wish more songs on the record were as heavy as Animate or Sick It Out, but this is another fantastic album, really top-notch songwriting from beginning to the end. Um, this was the last transition from the guys because I think that since this record they pretty much kept doing the same heavy riff-oriented music. Plus, it's, in my opinion, the last really fantastic record that Rush released. This is also a record that sort of polarizes fans, but I think it's a great one. At number six, we have probably the most transitional record from Rush, and it's Signals from 1982. Now, even though the two preceding records saw Rush becoming slightly less progressive and more accessible, but they remain the same amount of experimental drive and those artistic aspirations, but Signals was where Rush completely redefined themselves, um, especially in terms of sound. Now the guitars were more in the background and suddenly there were these huge walls of keyboards and synthesizers, something that not many people appreciated, but I think it's amazing to see that Rush started something completely new, but at their core there still remained the same progressive and experimental group, just with different tools at their disposal. This record is just such a huge achievement of its own. Now the songs are really great, uh, Subdivisions is this colossal track, uh, Losing It, I love that electronic violin, beautiful track. Uh, the only two minor complaints I have that Countdown is slightly weaker and at times it resembles Subdivisions, and New World Man is also a song that could do with a better chorus. But apart from that, fantastic sounding record where they, where they proved why they are one of the best groups in the world, really. Number 5, 2112 from 1976. Now this is one of the two records that is usually considered to be among the best from Rush. I can see why. The title track 2112 is one of those tracks that you really need to listen to with the knowledge of what the lyrics are about. The story is fantastic, the song is put together geniusly and really you should listen to Rush and not just to this record but to most of their discography with the lyric sheet in front of you to know what the words are about because Neil Peart is just a fantastic songwriter and this song is just epic. I also love how balanced the record is because you have the first half of the LP the 20 minute long 2112 and then the second half is made out of shorter tracks which are in no way weaker than the title track. Fantastic album from start to finish, it has an atmosphere of its own and this is the album that really put Raj on the map and they never really went away. At number three we have a follow-up record of Farewell to Kings from 1977. Again, a relatively transitional record where Rush became a full-blown prog metal space rock outlet. Um, Xanadu and Sinus X1 are huge songs. Uh, I think that this record is great from start to finish. It's very different from the previous record, but it's just, you know, I can't complain. I can just praise this record. Fantastic. At number three we have another transitional record, something that I've been using a lot today. 
a record that, in my opinion, tends to be a little overlooked, and it's Power Windows from 1985. Now, this is a record that saw Rush still using all those synthesizers and the keyboards, but getting into a more of an accessible territory. Now, Signals and Grace Under Pressure are both records that sound commercially, but they are pretty artistic and pretty difficult to listen to at times. You really need to pay attention. Power Windows is no different. The only difference is that it's made to sound very poppy. Even when you listen to the record for the first time, there will be many moments and many melodies that you will remember, but with the repeated listenings you will realize how artistic and genius this record is. I love this record. Some people criticize the outdated production. I guess it's a matter of taste, but Power Windows is a masterpiece. Number two, Hemispheres from 1978. Now, this was probably the most progressive Rush ever got. I mean, Sinus X1 Book 2 is just one of the best long tracks I've ever heard. It's just so genius. An interesting thing is that it even tops 2112. Then you've got Lavila Strangiato, a very complex instrumental. Then you've got two shorter tracks. What more to say? This album is perfect from start to finish. Not more I can say about this. Another masterpiece. So we have only one spot left. So you know it's Moving Pictures, a record that's generally considered to be their best. It's their commercially most successful record. What more to say? Tom Sawyer, huge song that they've played ever since. Limelight could have easily been a radio hit. It's a fantastic song and the first song I've heard from Rush. The beautiful instrumental YYZ. Camera Eye, probably the last really long progressive track. Fantastic album from start to finish. A masterpiece, really. I love this record. Uh, most of the Rush albums from 70s and 80s also influenced me as a musician. That is why my debut album has eight songs on the album. I really like fewer tracks where every track really feels like it matters. Two of the tracks are actually longer. One is 15 minutes long, another one is 8 minutes long or almost 9. Do you like my list? If you do, don't forget to like, to subscribe. Let me know in the comment section below what is your own list of Rush records from worst to best. I know that it varies from fan to fan. And thanks a lot for watching.